The province of Shandong, the birthplace of Confucius, has been carved up by German imperialism. Its most valuable land falling within not just one, but two German jurisdictions. The port of Qingdao, once devastated by the war between Japan and Germany, now serves as an important base for both the Imperial German Navy and for civilian trade, conducted by the AOG Consortium and the government of German East Asia. The other major port of the province, Wei Highway, is currently controlled by German East Asia, and thus by the German Navy, unlike Qingdao, which is controlled by the AOG. The capital of the province, Jinan, has served the Qing Empire as a barrier to the concessions that they made to Germany in 1897. This relationship has made the city the perfect home for the real power in Shandong, the warlord Zhang Songchang, Zhang King for Shandong in 1911, ostensibly to lead the Shandong Revolutionary Army, but quickly he made gambling and whoring his main activity. The capital has grown like the dog meat general has. Filthy, profitable, and perhaps less defended than originally planned. Songchang maintains order throughout Lower Shandong directly through military force, and the citizens of the province by 1936 have been cornered between his rule and disconnected and poverty stricken roads of the province. According to some, the only salvation for the people lies in the nearby city of Tai'an at, at the top of Mount Tai. At the top of the mound's 6,600 steps lies the headquarters of the Yi Quan Dao cult. The mysterious and apparently holy teacher of the cult, Zhang Tianran, has made it the safest and most morally upright place in Shandong province. Mount Tai's community of monks were once used by Emperor Pu Yi and would be Emperor Yuan Shikai as tools for legitimacy, but they were neglected by both in their time. Despite this neglect, Tianran remains loyal to the Qing Emperor. The Yi Guan Dao cult represents a multifaceted and syncretic religion that offers welfare services as a hook to introduce their teachings throughout northern China. Their ostensibly pacifist appearance has attracted thousands of pilgrims, peasants, and even soldiers to Shandong. The soldiers that do join the ranks of the Yi Guan Dao mostly come from the fugitive Big Swords and Red Spears societies. Ever ready to give their lives for an order in a province, they enforce Tianran's wishes across Shandong. So, welcome back everyone to another Kaiserreich progress report uh, for the China thing rework. This time we're going to take a look at Shandong, obviously, as you probably already uh, saw. And uh, here we have some very, very interesting stuff. Now, as you saw already, it is home to the most baddest warlord in existence, aka Zhang Zongchang, greatest man ever, <laughs> probably my favorite warlord, uh, that's saying a lot. So yes, uh, he in real life was also the warlord of Shandong, although not exactly the same as in uh, the Kaiserreich timeline. Uh, and yeah, so in 1946 you start off with this. Uh, is this what I already have? Uh, no, not exactly. I need to go back to here. Right, uh, so you start off and you uh, you have this screen that greets you. You are part of the Tsongchang clique, which is aka uh, Zhang, uh, Zhang Tsongchang's little group of buddies, which includes himself, and uh, the Shangqing Tianguo. Now, the Shangqing are, well, what would become the Shangqing Tianguo, aka the lovely, lovely Yi Guan Dao cult. Now, the story goes that uh, the click does the, what the click will, and we will see what that is. And. The cult, which sets up atop Mount Tai, which is also in Shandong province, relatively, uh, you know, relatively important place, uh, essentially <laughs> heals him because he does not have the money to afford medicine. So, yes, essentially, that allows them to set up the base 100% legally. Now, the, the both of these groups, both the military clique, the warlord, 
and the religion are allied nominally to the Qing Empire, although the religion is kind of devoted to the Qing Empire, whereas the warlord just kind of wants to, you know, rule. And so now the cult is legal both in the eyes of the local warlord and in Qing. And so waves of immigrants begin to escape to them because one, uh, Zhang Zongchang's province is, uh, you know, an, an interesting place. So it's kind of the Wild West in a way, apparently, uh, represents a form of economic freedom. And Tianran also attracts people to come in because of his, uh, you know, great benevolence and, uh, you know, moral teachings or whatever. Now, uh, yeah, exactly like this guy wants to make some very, very nice people. We're going to take a look at the religion first. Now, we will be skipping through pretty much most of this because... It's not really well. That, okay, so the this is actually quite int quite important. So you start off, at least on paper, in the Qing Empire, and you have a relatively good starting military. Now, if I could find where I put that, as always, the links for all of this will be will be down below in the description. Uh, look at that picture. Um, hmm. Do I not have that? This might be bad. Okay. No. Yeah, well, okay. Guess I gotta fetch it. Uh, so yeah, you start off with this lovely... Oh no, I did have it. Well, I appear to be an idiot. So you start off with this lovely army. And it is composed of, as you can see, both infantry, uh, cavalry, which has Japanese names, and there's a reason, and militias. And the militias are the, you know, religious uh, fanatic troops, the cult followers peasant uh, militias that are essentially self-defense forces but you know obviously they can be mobilized the warlord troops which um, as you can see are pretty bad although you know you can obviously uh, get them back together because they're kind of a collection of like mercenaries bandits all that kind of stuff all kind of thrown in together and the Japanese cavalry uh, or at least Japanese named cavalry which is trained by your lovely Japanese commander people uh, that you can see over here. You can see there's some Japanese people in here. They're essentially runaways from Japan, outlaws that have been that have fallen in with uh, Jiang Song Chang's little clique due to, you know, it's the only place where they can live and they can murder people. So that's just a lovely place. So yes, the cavalry are the personal units of Song Chang's Japanese commanders. Uh, the large under underground peasant anti-invasion force is also circling in Sh Shandong, composed of the Red Spears and Big Sword societies that Tianran has attracted. Now, uh, taking a look at these Red Spears and uh, Big Swords, these are quite important because um, they haven't been created by Kaiserreich or by, you know, the Iguandao. They are actually kind of important throughout late 19th and early 20th century China as a kind of just a nuisance for everyone that was traveling around North China trying to, you know, impose any kind of law or stuff. Uh, essentially, the big swords, it's lovely because they're literally called the Big Sword Society. And the Red Spears later on actually kind of fall in with uh, some of the other players of um, of the Chinese Civil War, such as the Chinese Red Armies. And uh, yeah, they, the root of these societies, these self-defense peasant societies or whatever, is actually, you know, just China, just a, like rich tradition in Chinese, like, you could say self-defense banditry or societies, which dates, you know, a long, long time back. And uh, yeah, it's quite nice that they exist because it makes sense. And it's also something that links the links the glorious, <laughs> the glorious Iguandao and the Shangqing Tianguo, or the Heavenly Kingdom of like pure whatever. I don't remember exactly. 
exactly what they what they call it. It doesn't. Yeah, so it just says Chenqing Tianguo. Does it say anywhere what the bloody thing actually means? It's supposed to be like the pure kingdom of something. I don't remember. Doesn't tell me. Oh well. Um, it's kind of based. Kind of. Again, they say that it's not related, but it's definitely inspired by the uh, Heavenly Kingdom of, Pe uh, of Great Peace, the Taiping Tianguo, which is another Heavenly Kingdom that is quite important in Chinese society, which also was based on a mountain, the Thistle Mountain, uh, initially at least, and which also uh, fell in with secret societies and uh, stuff like that. They're both millenarian religions, which you can take a look at later, essentially religions that kind of um, kind of say that there's some kind of apocalypse coming in after which, you know, society um, can be reformed into a just and moral utopia kind of thing. And yeah, so that's exactly what the cult kind of is, uh, except they don't want to overthrow the empire, they just kind of want to overthrow the warlords and the foreigners for the empire. So honestly, um, that's something that's different from uh, the earlier Kaiserreich timeline. And uh, I guess it's more fitting with the real-life Iguandao, and uh, yes, Iguandao is a real thing, you can see it over here, and apparently it still exists, which is kind of derp. Um, it exists in Taiwan, it's apparently kind of a weird... Um, not just in Taiwan, actually, also in Korea, Japan, and uh, back in mainland China, uh, after it was banned for a while there. You can see our lovely boy Tianran over here. So yes, that's um, that's uh, like in real life they kind of became Japanese collaborationists in a way. Uh, not 100%, but you know, kind of. Uh, and they weren't really that involved in like politics, although they were. Uh, <laughs> like just not you know outright trying to establish their own little state. So yes, it is more realistic, but at the same time, eh, 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 who cares? Um, yeah, so we take a look at their focus tree and stuff first, so that we get them out of the way. Because they're the guys that I know less about. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yes. That's what they try to do. Uh, he... Okay, so what happens is... There's some stuff that, that goes down with... Uh, I will not like go in detail, but if you decide to go down with the cult path, the Iguandao cult, then what will happen is that you will kill Zhang, Song Chang, and you will essentially take over the government as Zhang Qianran. He is national populist, as you can see, and his party is the Iguandao Hui, the Iguandao Society, most likely. And apparently he has 7 million adherents across China with only 500,000 members located within the Shangqing itself. You declare the Shangqing Tianguo, the Shangqing Heavenly Kingdom. You get the assistance of the Big Swords and the Red Spears. Um, and the Big Swords are not just in Shandong province, they're also outside the province, so that gives you some nice bonuses. You get a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of instability and stuff like that. You get a nice... Uh, Nice little biography there, which is always nice. And yes, apparently you are upheld to be the most morally upright government in China. However, you are still um, gonna be part of like the Qing sphere. Not exactly sure if it's just gonna be an ally or a puppet kind of thing. But yes, uh, what they want, as it says over here, somewhere. Um, Shangqing. Yeah, the ultimate goal is to ensure the legitimacy of the Iguandao and the existence of the Shangqing Tianguo. And um, to do that, they will, again, you know, police in a way territory for the Qing. Um, essentially, the hierarchy has the Qing Empire on the top, but the Iguandao has their commissars down below. So essentially, the Iguandao kind of becomes a state within a state, in a way. Um, although it's not opposed to the Qing, in theory. Uh, which, I'm not sure how exactly that would work, but 
I guess it does, because China's weird. Okay, the, the heavenly... The pure kingdom upon... No, wait, what? The heavenly host of the pure kingdom. No, 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 this is the heavenly kingdom. Of the pure host? Who knows? I don't care. <laughs> I don't care anymore. So yes. So if you triumph over uh, Jiang Zongchang, you got a bunch of stuff to wield uh, to deal with. But uh, he is very anti-foreign. Despises the Western influence in Qingdao, and the Qing want to use him to uh, kind of, you know, be a, a nuisance to the Westerners and to police Shandong. Um, in their stead because you know it's a place full of bandits and stuff like that uh so yes uh, if we take a look at the focus tree which we should have somewhere yes over here we can see that the way you go down is a uh, two jungs enter however there are three paths one is the cult as you can see jiang chenran over here uh, which uh, does your stuff then you have the Qing Puppet Tree, uh, Benevolence and Morality, which is about Song Jian, but, you know, he's the least interesting guy. We're gonna get done with him very, very quickly. Or A Story of a Bastard, which is Zhang Songchang, which is amazing. Anyway, um, so if you take the cult, what you're gonna have is that you have to take the Army of Fanatics, <laughs> which... Um, allows you to sort of integrate the militias that you already have and once you take over other territory uh, you will or rather not just when you take over other territory you will go ahead and take the improved roads to Beijing uh, thing and actually no this one is uh, common to everyone what happens down in the bottom that's important is actually right uh, is reclaiming the spoiled industry so, uh, Zhang Qianran wants Chinese-owned factories, obviously, and um, the other man, uh, the other Zhang, Zhang Songchan, the warlord, wants the foreign-owned factories because he wants to sell them to get opium and stuff like that. So yes, he is a truly great man. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the military of the of the heavenly kingdom as you can see is mostly militias you will lose the uh, regular infantry because the commanders are loyal to the warlord state and um, you will get some cavalry for the focus tree and stuff like that and your ultimate objective is to take over Nanjing and the League of Eight Provinces to again establish true Qing order to the rebellious south which is basically coincidentally the same as Zhang Songchang's objective, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, so yeah, after you've done you've dealt with most of that, then uh, yeah, you're in a relatively decent place. Um, oh, and another thing that they do kind of is that they declare the apocalypse has come, but and that's just it's just a secondary thing. Another of the paths. Well, actually, there's also a few decisions that you can take, although it's kind of weird because I'm not sure it says End Peasant Riot or End Tsongchang Riot. You can see that it's got a great flag, by the way. That's the that's the Heavenly Kingdom's flag. It's quite good. Um, why would there be Peasant Riots? I'm not 100% sure, but whatever. Uh, and then, as you can see, you can intervene in the League War if uh, the Nanjing clique exists. And you gain claims on a lot of places, which is quite nice. You can see it even starts from Qingya and Guangzhou, uh, so down at the south south of China. So you can expand quite a lot as these people, which is great, just amazing. It even gives you missions, so they're using a lot of mechanics. And uh, so yeah, that's that's really really nice. Uh, so the expansion path for these guys is the south. Um, same. It's same for essentially all the uh, all the paths, as far as I know. The boring path is uh, Song Zhiyuan, which is Song Zhiyuan's path, because he's just basically a Qing kind of uh, a Qing agent. He's loyal to the Qing, 
although he used to be part of the KMT. The KMT, you know, he's dis disillusioned with them and so just kind of wants to reassert order to the province. Uh, he's this man. And um, what he does is he returns to the source, aka the Qing. And I'm not sure if he becomes the puppet or anything, but he doesn't seem to have, or at least the progress support doesn't really indicate that he has any options for like big expansion. Although he says, like his legitimate office in Jinan will attempt to right course after years of mixed management and dis distractions. Uh, these distractions include the dissolution of the League of Eight Promises. So uh, I'm not sure. Well, does he also want to dissolve the League of Eight Promises? Does he not want to? I have no idea. <laughs> Although he apparently has one of the largest armies in China. So yes, that's them. Um, taking a look at the rest is Zhang Song Chang. Now, let's see if I have missed anything. Let's see if I have missed anything. No, 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 no. Oh yeah, White Lotus. Um, you should take a look at this. Essentially, it's one of the uh, it's one of the old Chinese millenarian religions that is kind of uh, the ur er millenarian religion. Like, even though it was essentially just completely extinct, extinct, it, well, all the people that practiced it were murdered by some point. Uh, it just kind of continued to come back because it was kind of used as an umbrella term for all kinds of religious rebels in a way um yeah that's that uh, that's one of the generals oh yeah right the generals so the shangqing heavenly kingdom has a couple of unique generals one of them isn't important or well he is important but not as much as the other one the other one is uh, yang jingyu he um or jingyu uh he is very very important one of the probably biggest Chinese heroes of the period, IRL, because he was a uh, guerrilla fighter against Manchukuo, um, and he was pro-CP, uh, you know, Chinese Communist Party. So yes, relatively, uh, he was sent over to Northeast China, and uh, yeah, he was very, very important. Very, very important. Uh, for the Chinese resistance against the Japanese imperialism and stuff like that. And he, yeah, you, you can see here a screenshot of the war that's um, that's going on for the liberation of the South. Although somehow, apparently, not sure if... Um, I don't know, whatever. Um, so apparently it's a very difficult war. Although it's probably more difficult here because they started it like right at the start. There's only 4% world tension, so whatever. Yeah, you get this awesome cavalry or whatever. Uh, Song Jiuyuan, right, this is Song Jiuyuan's, like, screen. He's a authoritarian democrat. His whole thing is the Society of Restoring Benevolence, the Hui Fu Renze. And, uh, yeah, he's just, I don't know. Um, his public commitment to the Qing is resounded in blah, blah, blah. He's boring. Like, he's just that. <laughs> he's pretty boring. Also, I don't like the Qing. So, if people restore the Qing, I don't like it. And yeah, so that's, the, that's just the focus tree. Getting this back over to the thing over here. I'm gonna also get this there. And this goes away, because I'm done with it. Oh yeah, right, the Honored Master. I haven't looked at that spirit but who cares about the national spirit <laughs> anyway i'll leave these so that i can later link them down below and yes here we go with the progress report now we go back to the start the other um the other government the other member is the Tsongchang click this is just the greatest warlord gang that there is he's an opium like the warlord is an opium addict he is Pretty much everything that you do not want to see in China, and uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see exactly how. Zhang Tsongchang himself was born to a practicing witch, and his father was an alcoholic musician. 
As an adult, he was self-described graduate of the School of Forestry, aka Banditry, and at six foot six, he was the tallest of the warlords. His troops have been terrifying local civilians. They are famous for their rapacity and for splitting melons, aka bashing skulls with rifle butts. He has become famous as the epitome of the wicked warlord. His life is so notorious that it is difficult to separate history from slander. All that is bad in China is laid at his door. Victims and enemies magnify Zhang into a poster boy for evil and avarice. Song Chang himself felt no great national pride for the loss of Qingdao in 1897, but the 1911 revolution did spur him into action. Arriving in Shanghai to pledge allegiance to the Republic, he eventually fell in with Zhang Suolin and the Feng Tian clique. When Feng Tian and Zhe Li cliques turned on each other later that year, Song Chang was withdrawing his forces from across northern China and back into Shandong province. Zhang participated in most of the subsequent wars. He has pushed as far as Shanghai in the south in 1924 and almost as far again in 1926, but he eventually betrayed the Feng Tian clique and rejoined the Qing Empire. During those hard years of war, Zhang and his soldiers destroyed the local economy through mismanagement and outright devastation. From 1925 to 1928, 89% of the provincial budgets, aka 50 other 56 million yuan, were spent on the ragtag military force of the warlord. Being starved of funds, the provincial currency was issued as fast as printing allowed and became nearly valueless. Peasants, already angry with the warlord misrule, responded by forming militias, the Red Spears. Today, these Red Spears are under influence of the Yi Guandao cult. The devastation of Shandong was far removed from Zhang's headquarters in the capital of Jinan. More like a medieval court, it features extravagant entertainment, and at its center, puffing cigars is Zhang. Sometimes he is a benefactor to artists, writers, or entertainers. But he also acts arm, attracts armed dealers, drug kingpins, diplomats, and a stream of Western journalists who have dubbed him China's basest warlord. He mainly deals in weapons with Germany and Norway. German steamers ferry thousands of rifles into the province, although sometimes the ammunition doesn't match the weapons. However, Zhang, like every warlord, is dependent on his arms purchases and is grateful to his business partners. In fact, after one deal, he's even reported to have given two evening dances as a show of gratitude to the German businessmen. In his domestic effort to increase his military capabilities, Zhang Songchang also utilizes Western resources to build up his arsenals, which have to manufacture the missing ammunition. However, the general doesn't only deal in weapons. In September 1927, he issued an opium monopoly in Shandong province under the name Transhang Jinyang Zouyu aka the Provincial Opium Suppression Bureau. Posted on the doors of the branch office of the bureau was this notice. People of all counties, how much opium do you want to plant? If you do this, the people will prosper. Report it and pay a small fine on each piece of land and you can plant as much as you want. Farmers who plant the poppy are thus patriotic Shandongese. So yes, uh, John Songchang is a great man. Essentially, warrior, poet, bandit, you know, uh, he's got some perks, but he's also got a lot of problems with him. Uh, he has been fleshed out actually quite a bit in the minor Monday 28. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, he gets into a fight with the cult members right at the start. And he can win, which is quite good for us because, you know, it's great. Uh, so what he has is uh, the Dog Meat General, which, oh wow, it's actually really good. Let's look at that army experience, although it might get nerfed. Um, and the Flight to the North, obviously, uh, because just people want to be there. <laughs> Essentially, the remnants of the military are his power base, really. And um, his generals are a bunch of really, really interesting people, as you can see. It's these guys. You can read their their bios over here. 
and there are some nice individuals. Every one of them, except Su Yuan Chuan, that's a name and a half, uh, which is the level one person over here. Uh, they're all apparently wanted for murder somewhere in China. Mm. And Su Yuan Chuan is wanted for opium trafficking, which is just nice. Uh, you can see their bios over here, like this man over here. Uh, while he was governor, his troops committed many atrocities, including killing civilians, robbing the wealthy, and rape. Glorious. Uh, he became involved in a scheme of the Empire of Japan to set up the monarchy of Pui in northern China with Japanese money. An assassin shot him fatally, wounded him in Beijing's Grand Hotel. What a great man. Uh, Sun Yin, so that was um, Zhang Jinyao, the man at the top. And Sun Yin, the guy down below, who looks just a very, very nice man, he earned notoriety for changing sides multiple times in those conflicts. And you can even see just the amount of various different allegiances that he had is just, he could fill a whole thing. The collaboration of 6th Army Group District, you know, just, just the kind of stuff. Uh, then we have Date Junosuke, uh, some Japanese man of whom apparently there's only a Wikipedia page in Chinese and in Japanese. So I will not look at who he is, but what a man also probably. Uh, his only picture apparently has him with a sword. It's just nice. And there is also this other person, the Shiro guy, Shiro Kokinata. So he's got a lot of anime behind him. And obviously Shu Yuan Chuan, uh, just a great man. He was involved in the opium trade. So yes, uh, it's quite good to be Jan Son Chang, as you can see. He likes it. And um, yeah, so he doesn't know how many women are in his brothels, uh, famously. He also has some problems getting his economy under track because apparently the mining corporations refuse to pay him taxes. And I'm not sure if they mention it in the focus tree or in the events or in the decisions, but again, Shandong is pretty much bankrupt at this point, even though it's one of the richest provinces in China uh, because of the hyperinflation, so maybe you're going to have to deal with that. Um, you can rebuild Shandong's Beiyang fleet. Now, Beiyang... Actually, I probably should have had Beiyang. Yes. So, the Beiyang fleet is a relative... No. Beiyang fleet. There's a lot of Beiyang stuff. Uh, so, Beiyang means northern seas. And uh, it's quite important. So, the Beiyang fleet was quite nice. Um, and Shandong was important in it. Because Wei Haiwei, uh, which is... Let's see if I have it anywhere here. Yes, Wei Highway, which is the port. God damn it! Are you kidding me? But yeah, you can see where it is. It's on the right tip of the peninsula. You can see the right little thing there, um, which in real life was again a British colony, or at least was taken over by Britain at some point. In Kaiserreich, it gets taken over by the uh, Germans after the British. Uh, used to be pretty much China's main naval base, and its loss to Japan was uh, relatively bad, which caused China to lose the first Sino-Japanese War. Or at least it's what, you know, finally pushed the Chinese to sue for peace and surrender. Uh, so yes, this is all the these are all the events that happen. If you win, uh, you get the Yiguan Dao and Peasant Riot, which is obviously not the best, but you need to murder them eventually. And the flight to the north becomes the flight to Tsongchang. Uh, so yes, uh, apparently more resource gain, efficiency, more stability, but not much. <laughs> and more political power. Um, so yeah, uh, that's just because essentially it's... Uh, this place liberalizes a lot of stuff, so people want to go there. <laughs> Which is... I guess kind of nice. It's kind of a Singapore. Um, well, not, not exactly. Kind of a Hong Kong, really. Yeah, kind of a Hong Kong. Or a Shanghai, as it's also said. It's a hub of uh, scum and villainy. And yes, so his core clique is his five remaining regular divisions, but they are depreciated due to the inactivity and mercenary composition. Now, in real life, 
uh, this mercenary composition actually led to a lot of interesting people getting involved with um, with the Shandong click aka white Russian mercenaries now I'm not sure if there's any way I can well it okay so it does talk about it in the John Sunshine Wikipedia page um, <laughs> essentially since he used to be part of the uh, Manchurian Funk Yankalik under John Swollen. He had a lot of connections in Russia, and so he eventually got to recruit a bunch of white Russian mercenaries, and they were emigrates from the Russian Civil War. Now, of course, in Kaiserreich, the Russian Civil War is not won by the Reds, so <sighs> he does not unfortunately get his 5,000 white Russian mercenaries with armored trains, which by the way included a very very famous armored train, the Orbeck train. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, I guess we can, could just have this one. The Orlik or the uh, Zamuriets, which is a very very interesting story by the way. Uh, I'm gonna let this link be down there. Eventually this train ends up in Manchuria, and eventually it gets sold to John Song Chang, who made use of it. And uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is a very, very interesting and obscure page in history because apparently these trains were, in real life, a big part of John Song Chang's military success. Now this cannot happen because it was partially due to, again, this train over here. And a few others of the ones that end up in uh, the arsenals of Shandong. They were manned by the Czechoslovak Legion or the White Russians. So since in uh, Kaiserreich timeline, one, the Czechoslovak Legion probably doesn't exist because the Austro-Hungarian Empire still exists. Two, or maybe if it does, I have, actually I have no idea. I should, I should ask if any of uh, if any Kaiserreich uh, developer is actually watching this. What the fuck happened to the Czechoslovak Legion? Whatever. Uh, it would be interesting to know. Um, and if it did exist, why doesn't John Zonchan get something about the Czechoslovak Legion? Because, you know, again, in the end, they did end up selling the trains to them. Uh, or, again, the White Russians. But the White Russians do not lose, so they do not have to run away from Russia. So this development of new weapons that ends up in the Feng Tian click and so the Shandong click by proxy does not happen in the Kaiserreich alternate timeline. Which is very unfortunate. And he also doesn't get his uh, lovely Tsarist mercenaries. Who apparently were quite not good <laughs> to like random people. And so the KMT, when they fought these white Russian mercenaries, they just massacred them. They didn't take them prisoners. Also because the KMT in real life was supported by the Soviets. And so there was this kind of proxy war going on in China in the 1920s between... You know, the remain, remainders, essentially, of White Russia, who were fighting for the Feng Tianklik and uh, the Northern Warlords, versus the nationalists that were supported by the Soviets. And so the Soviets, which had Soviet commissars, you know, common turn people supporting them, uh, were being told, oh, sorry, the uh, nationalists were being told to massacre these people, not just because they were legitimately, you know, rapists and stuff, also because they were the enemies of the people that were supporting the nationalists. Unfortunately, because uh, the Russian Civil War went the other way around, this ridiculous and amazingly interesting proxy war is not going to be happening in Kaiserreich China. But yeah, it would be very, very nice if it could in some way live, but it doesn't make any sense. So yes, for realism's sake, we'll have to live with that. Um, so you have to, you know... Um, you have to kind of make do with ridiculous Japanese mercenaries instead of Japanese and Russians, which uh, to me is a downgrade, but uh, well, uh, so yes, uh, they're all criminals. <laughs> Essentially, like the military of this this thing is all criminals. And Zhang Zongchang, his ultimate objective is um, uh, retaking Nanjing and Shanghai. Working with the Germans and uh, reminding Zhang Zolin of his former loyalty. 
so Swollen and the Japanese can be Zhang's allies if he wants a slice of the Qing pie. So again, the uh, the Heavenly Kingdom are in favor of the Qing Empire. Zhang, not really. He is under their rule, I guess, as a, an expedient. But um, you know, if so, if the tide kind of turns, then he can ally up with the Japanese and uh, you know help restore the Republic under Zhang Suolin, under which he probably would have a big role. Or, I don't know, maybe maybe if uh, Tsolin just fucks up with the Japanese, maybe you can even get a chance to just retake all of China or something, but it's probably highly unlikely. The Shandong Click will not be able to really reunite China in a normal game. Uh, they, were, they were just going to be the sort of second, second greatest, you could say, force in China behind whoever's winning. Which, in case of the Heavenly Kingdom and Song Zhi Yuan, are going to be the Qing. In the case of Zhang Songchang, it can be whoever. Probably the Japanese and uh, Zhang Suolin. So yeah, uh, he's going to die eventually, unfortunately, apparently. Uh, if he dies and is cleaned up, <laughs> which is this portrait, just amazing, and is cleaned up of like the opium and stuff like that, uh, I believe... Someone takes over. I don't remember exactly who. Does it say down here? Uh, uh, they can they can join the Qing's faction. Hmm. <laughs> Song Chang can join in Feng Tian's war against the Qing, and now I for them Japan and the Cold Prosperity Sphere. Okay, very good. Uh. Okay, so Sung Jian is only in internal development. Well, this is pretty good that I saw it. Um, God damn it. Mm. <laughs> I don't see... Yeah, who replaces Zhang? I have no idea. It would be kind of nice if you could ally up with the Germans as well, but you're gonna have to deal with, I guess, only, only dealing with them as a business partner. Hmm, it's not saying. I am 100% sure it's written in here somewhere who can replace Zhang, except, again, uh, the other one. If not, then Sun Jianying waits at the end of the tunnel. So Jianying is <laughs> this glorious man, and if Zhang does not get himself cleaned up, he's gonna die, and he takes over. He believes he is the descendant of a 16th century Qing warlord, which is just amazing. Uh, Sun Chang Song. I actually do not know who he is. Is he one of the free feudatories or something? It's not telling me. Okay, whatever. Who cares? Probably not important. Um, <laughs> Tian Ying's entire life, without interruption, has been spent demolishing institutions in his way. Sun burned down his school as a child, took a group of bandits into an anti bandit association, and led them through Hunan to pillage. Sun's leadership of the clique, if Song Chang to die, would lead to reckless destruction in the name of victory. I like Song Chang. Sun directs ire against Western Chinese like the Hui, uh, aka the Muslims, and rallies his soldiers in his hatred for Muslim Chinese. Yan Ying's disregard for property was so great in his early years that he looted a tomb of Empress Dowager Su Xi. Many more cultural artifacts are for up for grabs in Yan Ying's clique. So if this guy takes over, it sounds like it would be very, very um, fun to play, I guess, because you'd be, you know, doubling down on just being a crazy bandit. you just try to find, like, you know, expensive artifacts and get rich, hashtag rich, off of banditry or whatever, and you're gonna go ahead and go murder, like, genocide a bunch of people. I don't know, uh, they don't really show anything 
of that, but I guess it would be interesting to play. And I mean, a fitting end for Zhang Songchang, I guess, does make sense, you know? But whatever, we're gonna see. So this is the uh, Shandong click. It is probably one of the first clicks I'm gonna play in Kaiserreich uh, 8.9, or sorry, 0.9, the China update. Because one, again, John Song Chang is my favorite warlord. And two, this place is just awesome. So yes, I want to thank you all for watching. Hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you soon.